According to the uh, Census Bureau, uh, Hispanics um, are uh, is Hispanics and Latinos are approximately like 17 percent of the U.S. population, and uh, I think that they are like 18 percent or so of the New York State population, like uh, 20 percent of the Brooklyn uh, County, uh, the Kings County uh, population, 30 percent of New York City's population. So I think we have very strong connections with uh, with uh, the Hispanic world. Uh, not only the Hispanic world, uh, not only the Spanish-speaking world, but also uh, with Latin America and the Caribbean. Right? So what I'm uh, going to refer to here is uh, that whole region that is south of the United States, um, all the way to the uh, Antarctica, um, and includes uh, a myriad, uh, a tiny islands, some of them, in the Caribbean. So it includes from very large uh, land masses like Brazil, Mexico, Argentina, which are the three uh, in terms of uh, territory and in terms of population are among the, uh, the, the and in terms of economic power are the leading uh, countries. And, uh, and then in the Caribbean, you have islands like lar the, the largest one, which is Cuba, and uh, very small ones like Anguilla, San Martin, St. Vincent, uh, all those uh, small islands in the Caribbean. So this is a very diverse region, uh, demographically, ethnically, and, uh, uh, and, and also culturally. It's very, very diverse, right? Uh, uh, so let me start by showing you uh, a few basic facts about Latin America. So Latin America uh, covers uh, approximately like 13% of the global land mass um, and uh, it's a little bit over one, over twice the area of the United States. The population of Latin America is less than 600 million people out of the seven point something billion people uh, 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 that is the world population. So it's less than, uh, less than twice the US population. So the density, the population density, that's the number of people per square miles or per square kilometers is, uh, is below the U.S. Uh, density. And uh, of course, uh, the distribution of people are very uh, uh, geographically is, uh, uh, you know, mostly in coastal areas. And uh, about 80% of the Latin American population is urban. That means that they live in mega cities or large cities. And the largest metropolitan areas are uh, the ones that are listed there. You know, like approximately still like 20% of, uh, of the population uh, live in rural areas. So by the way, uh, the percentage of urban population in Latin America is larger than say in uh, European countries. Um, and uh, so that actually uh, talks about, uh, you know, uh, kind of the violent dislocations that have happened in Latin America historically that have pushed people out of rural areas, right? basically because of social conflict and because of poverty. So people looking for opportunities in, the, in cities where uh, you know, public services may not uh, be available to the extent uh, required to meet the needs of, of, uh, of these large crowds. So you have very large uh, metropolitan areas. Like Mexico City is the largest one, over 20 million people in the, in that, in the Valley of, of Mexico. It's not only what is, uh, you know, in terms of the political uh, uh, division of, uh, of Mexico, it's not only what is called the federal district, but it also includes areas that surround uh, Mexico City, like say the suburbs, but in Mexico the suburbs, uh, in, in the rest of uh, Latin American cities, the suburbs usually mean poverty. It really depends. You, you know, usually the ones on the, uh, on the eastern side are the poorer ones because the winds flow you know, in the, from, uh, from uh, west to east. So you don't want the smell of, you know, poor people to travel from the poor areas to the rich areas. So usually, you're, you're, if you look at those cities, it's on the, on the east where the large concentrations of poor people uh, will, will usually leave. Okay, let me tell you what the, what the rest of the lecture is gonna be about. Uh, uh, I'm going to uh, first uh, uh, show you uh, some empirical evidence 
that I'm drawing from very conventional sources um, uh, uh, to, to uh, show to you the economic trajectory of Latin America. And in some cases, I just select a few countries. Forgive me for that. It's a very broad, uh, a very broad uh, 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 topic that I have to cover. So sometimes I have to be very selective. And I, for example, I may choose just Brazil, Argentina, and Mexico, the three leading economies, as representatives. How representative they are economically, culturally, etc. that's something very questionable. But you, know, you have to forgive me, because they are about two thirds of the Latin American and Caribbean economy, so they, uh, you know, they are uh, uh, the leading ones. So I, I, I will have to do that. Um, so at first, I show you this empirical evidence uh, graphically. Uh, I'll try to be as clear as possible. I'm not assuming that you uh, have all taken macroeconomic courses. If you have taken them, of course, you will be able to to get more out of this lecture. And then I'm going to conclude with two sets of reflections. Number, the first one is just going to be kind of a summary of, uh, of, uh, of what I think the, uh, the statistical information, uh, the story that the statistical information uh, tells. And then finally, I'm going to make kind of a broader reflection on how to think about Latin America, and I, that I hope it's persuasive. OK, let me start with kind of the longer run recent but longer run performance. I'm talking here about uh, many decades uh, post-war, after the Second World War. And so this, uh, this uh, graph here shows very conventional uh, measure of economic performance, gross domestic product per capita. Uh, so that means uh, the, the, the total income <coughs> per person um, uh, in a given year. Right, so and the and the years are indicated on the horizontal axis. You may not be able to see them clearly, but it starts in 1950, and uh, this this data set this data set is one of the most respectable uh, databases uh, out there. Uh, it's called the Penn World Tables, and it's the largest database of comparable international data available. So uh, conventional and all kinds of economists rely on these statistics when they are looking at uh, you know, international comparisons. So the, the, uh, just for the purposes of comparison, I'm, using, I'm, I'm showing here the, uh, the growth or the trajectory of GDP per capita in the United States. Uh, that's, the, that's this one here. And then Japan and Germany, the three leading economies in the world. And then so that you can see by contrast, you know, like, like Latin America, the, the three leading economies, that's uh, Argentina, Brazil, and Mexico. Uh, this is Mexico. Uh, this is Brazil. This is Argentina. The blue one is Argentina. And uh, you see that they are like way below in terms of gross domestic product per capita or income per capita. This, it, it's roughly speaking, GDP is, is a measure of income or, or the value of output produced in an economy in a given year. So, uh, so it's less than half, less than half in per person terms. And now I'm also, for, for the purposes of comparison, showing you China. Uh, uh, China uh, is the green one. And you can see that China in the last 30, 40 years has exhibited a remarkable uh, expansion that uh, has allowed it to, it, China in, you know, in the post-war period started way below uh, you know, the leading economies of the world and way below uh, Latin America in per capita terms, right? This is not the total s size of the Chinese economy, but it's per person, and China has over one billion uh, people. Okay. Uh, this is a measure of productivity, so the story is very similar, right? This is uh, GDP, but per hour of labor engaged, engaged, instead of using the word employed, because employed, you have to abide by the conventional definitions, the Penn World Table people decided to call this engaged labor. And, um, and so uh, uh, it's a similar story. This is the, uh, the three leading countries in the world um, in economic terms, the US, uh, Germany, and Japan. And, um, and, the, uh, and the three Latin American countries. I don't have data for China. And so this is kind of a shorter period. This is between one and three decades, depend on the gra depends on the graph. And uh, I have here GDP per capita, and I have regions. So I he this is more a little bit more comprehensive. 
This is the performance of uh, the various regions compared to the world average. This is the world average, the red line. And you can see that Latin America was just, just above, uh, actually, uh, you know, in, 1950, in, in, in the 1990s, that was a kind of a significant distance from the average. But then that distance has narrowed down. That means that Latin America has stayed like around the average and even lagged behind. Lag behind whom? Well, uh, I think the most, uh, the most interesting event uh, in this period has been, of course, the rise of, the, of East Asia and Pacific, right? These are, uh, this includes not only China, but other heavy hitters like Japan, Korea, Australia, New Zealand, uh, Thailand, Vietnam, those. So uh, this is, uh, but this is per capita. So, and you can see that this is really remarkable, right? It started below, like about half of the global average, right, Southeast Asia, and then Southeast Asia has now like hit the average, right, whereas Latin America hasn't been able to pick up. And of course, the, the poorest uh, uh, regions of the world in terms of their productivity or their standard of living, uh, South Asia, that includes uh, India, the largest, uh, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Bangladesh, uh, those, those uh, countries, and uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, of course, uh, which has uh, stagnated uh, during this whole period. Um, uh, something uh, to note here is the, uh, the crisis that hit the uh, richer economies of the world, right? The, the, uh, the, uh, great, re uh, the great Recession uh, was called in the United States, but look also the European countries were, uh, you know, terribly affected by this, uh, by this phenomenon whose epicenter was like not too far from here, just across the bridge, right? And um, I mean, the, uh, uh, the explosion, the eruption started here. And uh, Latin America wasn't, I uh, kind of uh, uh, fielded the, the crisis uh, uh, somewhat well, but then uh, it may not be shown here, but in the last, uh, in the last couple of years, uh, I think that the, uh, the conditions have deteriorated for Latin America. So we'll, I'll talk quickly about that uh, later on. This graph, which is going to be, <laughs> which looks like uh, it's too much information, right? T TMI, students say, yeah, too much information. Well, I just wanted to highlight the diversity, or rather the economic differences, right? The inequality within the region. Like, you see how, uh, you know, there are countries that have relatively high uh, GDP per person. This is data from the World Bank. I, I was surprised to see that Cuba uh, was, is now included and uh, something is changing there. And, uh, and so you see that Cuba has actually in the last, uh, I'm talking about uh, the last, uh, what, 15 years or so, hasn't done too terribly, right? And uh, Chile, Uruguay, Panama, these this, uh, economies uh, have had, had uh, traditionally uh, relatively high GDP per per person in, uh, in, in the context of Latin America. And, uh, but you can see that there are countries like 80, you know, that uh, virtual stagnation. This is really a terrible tragedy uh, here. The, uh, and this graph shows growth rates, right? The, growth, the speed at which an economy expands or contract, right? So it expands if it's on the positive side and the positive side starts here and these are contractions. So when the economy falls below this line, the zero percent, you're talking about a contraction. The economy is just shrinking, right? So this is in, in terms of GDP, the flow of uh, uh, goods and services newly produced in an economy in a year. And, uh, and, and what I want you to note here, well, you may note many other things, but this is something that stands out from my point of view is the incredible volatility that the Latin American economies exhibit. Look at Argentina, the blue, the blue line. Now in finance, those of you, those students who are interested in finance, who have studied finance, right? You think of, of these fluctuations, this variability as a measure of risk, right? So I think it's, it's a good way to put this, right? In, in terms of the risk for the people of these countries, you know, how risky uh, the economy is for them. You know, how unstable their living and working conditions can be. You know, kind of overnight, you know, the economy melts down and you are unemployed, you are on the street. And you know, so that, that's, that's terrible. That's a dimension of, uh, you know, economic conditions that, that we, need to, uh, we need to highlight, right? And, and uh, Brazil, 
as well, Mexico as well, and compare that to the U.S. as the green one, right? And, uh, you know, we complain about the ups and downs of the economy, but by comparison, you know, look at even the, like, the Great Recession, right? This was devastating. The a U.S. unemployment rate went above 10%, right, which is, like, the worst, you know, after the Great Depression. So, uh, uh, you know, and, but yet compare it to Mexico. So the U.S. sneezed Mexico. This is, a, uh, this is a, an old joke, right? The U.S. sneezed and, the, and Mexico caught a cold. Okay, uh, this is usually one of the, one of those, uh, and I think they have a point, one of those uh, weaknesses, the strategic economic weaknesses of Latin America that conventional economists uh, usually highlight. And organisms, international organizations like the IMF or the World Bank uh, you underscore this weakness. And that is the fact that in Latin America, the rate at which people save and invest, that means the rate at which people build up their productive capacity, their productive wealth, is very slow by comparison to other regions of the world. And, and so uh, here's, a, here's a comparison. You can see the world, right? That's the world average. Well, Latin America, the leading economies in Latin America are below the world average in terms of investment rate, right? As a percentage of GDP, as a percentage of the total, uh, you know, again, the value of goods and services produced anew in an economy in a year, the portion of that that, uh, that goes to building up the uh, productive capacities for the future, right? That's below the world's, the world's average. And of course, compare it to China, you know? So this actually uh, is, is very telling about the prospects of, uh, of Latin America, uh, unfortunately, right? Um, the saving rate, this is from the funding side. Investment is from the spending side. This is from the domestic funding side. Savings rates are also, Latin America and the Caribbean, very, very low. They're traditionally very low, and look at their, how, they, how variable they can be, and then even declining in, recent, in the recent years. This is uh, before the headwinds in the global economy, right, that are now slowing down Latin America tremendously. And, uh, and so compared to East Asia and Pacific, now, uh, the point of an economy, I tell my students, is people, right? That's the point of an economy. So let's look at, the, at, at how, uh, how the, the benefits of what I've been showing you, like, you know, income, how income is distributed, how the benefits of this economic performance are distributed within each of these countries, at least the leading ones. And so I'm including here Colombia. Um, if I include like Peru and other like important Latin American countries, then this gets very crowded. I tried to do Peru, Alex, but so uh, 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 but you can see that that, that uh, th this is the uh, the percentage of income that is appropriated by the uh, the, the richest ten percent or by the highest income you know the income bracket, the highest income bracket, the ten percent highest and. Uh, uh, and you can see that Latin America uh, has, uh, it's very unequal in terms of the distribution of its income. Very unequal because 10% appropriates like, like around 40%. Yeah, in some countries it may be even worse in some other Latin American countries. And compare that to, uh, to China or the United States. This is another measure of, uh, of Inequality, this is the Gini coefficient. Gini coefficient, a Gini coefficient of zero means that every household or every individual in, in a country uh, has the same, the same income share. So that means that everybody can, it's a completely egalitarian society, right? That would be a Gini coefficient of zero. That would be if, the, if a country were here. And so that means that countries that are more equitable in terms of the distribution of income are down here, and the countries that are more unequal are up here. Because a Gini coefficient of one means that one single household or a single individual gets all the income. So it's like you have a pie and then the, the one single household gets the entire pie. And so you can see the, uh, how uh, you know, the leading Latin American economies, uh, perhaps a slight exception would be Argentina, but Argentina is still, you know, it's up there. Uh, are, are uh, highly unequal, highly unequal, uh, and they are among the most unequal in the world. 
Um, something that is noticeable here is what has happened to, uh, to the Gini coefficient, to, to uh, inequality over the last, you know, over the last 10, 15 years or so. And you see that it's been kind of a little decline, right, little decline. And this has coincided with a shift, political shift in Latin America towards the left, right, uh, uh, towards the left. And it started with Hugo Chavez in the 1990s, but then Evo Morales and Rafael Correa and other leaders uh, uh, took office in, in, in big countries, important countries in South America. And then as a result of that, you know, you, you, you see this. And, and even though, uh, like, you know, some people will say, like, Colombia, well, Colombia has been, in, uh, you know, led by, has been governed by, uh, you know, right-wing uh, political parties. How come that they have, and I think that actually that is also the gravitational power of the, of the left. Of, you know, it's because, you know, you cannot have, you know, you are Colombia, you have Venezuela as your neighbor. You know, on average, Venezuela has higher income than Colombia, Colombia has, uh, it has uh, a, a long history of social conflicts. The, uh, the oldest guerrilla uh, war in Latin America, which hopefully is now ending, uh, is uh, in Colombia. And so uh, a lot of inequality, a lot of rural poverty in Colombia. So if you see that, you know, in Venezuela they are taking action, however, uh, uh, you know, you may judge uh, the measures taken by, by, by Chavez, uh, still, you know, that imposes the need in Colombia to, you know, to try to uh, alleviate some of these uh, manifestations of, you know, social, uh, you know, the, of, of poverty and all that. So I think that that's uh, related to that. And, uh, and he, this is a measure of, this is the poverty ratio. It's the number of people who are poor, and by poor here means that they earn uh, or they get two dollars per day or less, and uh, you can see that the, this is this is uh, just terrible. The the, the rates and uh, uh, and poverty. Ex this is extreme poverty. This is World Bank poverty. It's like less than one thousand dollars a year, right? Six hundred dollars, uh, over seven hundred dollars a year. So it's really nothing. Who can live? Uh, depends on context, right? But uh, uh, in in a in a urban context, it would be impossible even in Latin America to live with, uh, with less than $1,000 a year. But that's what this is about. This is really abject poverty. And uh, you know, good thing it's been declining, but it still remains a big challenge. So let me just sum up now, and so that I can have discussion and, and all that. So I think that uh, these are the, my, the main points I would like to highlight. Latin American poverty is a massive waste of human potential, right? So if this is, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, eight, nine percent of the world population, well, is not as large as Asia. Asia is like 60 percent of world population. Africa is also large. But, uh, but it's still a large chunk of the human race that is, uh, you know, under these conditions. And I, I, the way to think of it, I, I, I believe, is in terms of the opportunity cost that this imposes on, on the human race. And it's huge, you know, that you have uh, so much wasted uh, potential, so much wasted opportunity. And the other thing that I would like to emphasize is I, I haven't got, gotten uh, before World War II in my stories, but, uh, but the, the poverty in Latin America is not the result of natural evolution, it is actually the product of a very long tragic history of inequality and exploitation, right? That it's uh, pre-colonial, it didn't start with the invasion of the Europeans, by the Europeans, but, uh, but it was definitely sharpened to extremes, right? I, I mean, if you are familiar with the history of Latin America, uh, you know what I'm talking about. If you are not familiar, I recommend that you, uh, you know, do some research if you are interested, right? Uh, I mean, I'm talking about rivers or oceans of sweat, tears, and blood that, uh, that actually underpin a lot, a lot of uh, what we call Western civilization. So, like, it, 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 you know, when you think comprehensively, it includes the, uh, you know, not only the appropriation of land here, and of course the quasi extermination of the native peoples of this continent by the Europeans, right? And then the, the uh, uh, you know, the appropriation of natural wealth uh, from sugar to precious metals to you name it, right? And also, in, very significantly, the kidnapping of, massive kidnapping of Africans and then transporting them 
and using them here as a beast of burden, as slaves, you know, to, as, the, as the fuel of, uh, of the colonial economies. You know, like if you study the history of Brazil, I mean, you cry when you read those stories. Um, and we, it, it, you know, so uh, uh, I think we have to uh, be mindful of that because when we stroll along the avenues in Paris or in Vienna or in those places, we have to uh, realize that below that, you know, glitz, is, uh, it's a lot of suffering um, that, uh, uh, that uh, befell on, um, on Latin Americans, right? Mostly on indigenous populations and also on Africans or, or people of African ancestry. Um, the, the third point is that Latin Americans' integration in the world economy uh, has uh, subordinated the region to the, uh, to the dynamics, to the economic dynamics of the rich capitalist countries. And, and since the late 19th century, and especially from the, from the, the 20th century, uh, mainly to the United States of America. Um, uh, this is something that we as Americans don't usually uh, uh, you know, recognize. Uh, to overcome the poverty and the subordination uh, of Latin America, Latin Americans must, I think, this is my, my belief, must claim independence. Because if you don't have just basic, uh, uh, the ability to uh, rule your own destiny, right, to guide uh, your society in that direction according to your own priorities, then, uh, then you cannot really uh, accomplish much and you're going to be always lagging behind. This is not to pass on responsibility uh, for the conditions in Latin America to people abroad, but it's just to uh, understand that you need to, uh, you need to uh, be able to determine what are your priorities and then follow suit. And that requires, of course, much greater political unity in Latin America and even uh, regional cooperation, which, uh, you know, there are a lot of speeches when politicians from Latin America meet, they talk a lot about unity, but they are fortunately, uh, you know, there is very little follow up on it. And uh, the, the, the final reflection, this is going to be a bold statement on my part, but I, I really want to share it with you. I think that the way to think of, of Latin America, uh, even for those of us who have ancestry or connection to Latin America, shouldn't be in terms of what is best for Latin Americas in the short run or in the, sh in the narrowest sense, in the most immediate sense, I think that we have to think as humans because technology is making the world smaller. The cost of communications and even transportation has been declining dramatically. And, uh, and, and so as a result, we are becoming more and more interdependent. So I don't think that every history, we, uh, our individual fate has been more connected to our fate as a race, as a civilization. And so uh, I think that we have to think of, of, of those terms. And, um, and social inequality is huge and pervasive. And I'm not talking only in terms of you know, the inequality between Latin America as a region and the rest of the world, right? in particular the northern countries, but also within Latin America, as I try to show you. And, uh, and by social inequality, and let me, let me emphasize this point, by social inequality, I do not mean uh, diversity, right? I, don't, I, do not meet the, I do not meet the differences in talent and inclinations that people naturally have. By social inequality, what I mean is social hierarchy. Uh, just to, uh, to use an example that sometimes I mention in my classes, you know, just because you are a woman and I am a man, that, you know, because we have that natural difference, that doesn't mean that uh, that, that gives me no reason to be, uh, to, to be your master and for you to be my, my servant, right? If you have, uh, you know, a color, the color of your skin is different than mine, that doesn't mean that I'm going to be your master, you're going to be my slave. So uh, that's what I mean by, by social inequality. I'm talking about social hierarchies that are completely human-made. They are the result of history, and because they are human-made, they can be on make by humans. It's just a matter of restructuring the way we uh, connect with one another. And so uh, I think that social inequality, this history shows it very clearly that social inequality, that means these hierarchies in society necessarily lead to social conflict. Necessarily lead to social conflict. It's not only that the, uh, the people who benefit from the social order resist. That, I mean, you absolutely have no case in history where the wealthy and powerful have ever given up on their privileges, like voluntarily, like saying like, okay, let's share our wealth because we understand 
it makes no sense to have a society that is so, so organized. It's never, never happened. So that means that, that people who are privileged are going to cling to the privilege and they are going to, perhaps they are going to try to alleviate things a little bit so they don't have to look over their shoulders where they are enjoying their wealth and their power. But as a rule, they are not going to give it up. So that means that the onus of, of action is going to be on, is going to lie on, on the, as uh, the Occupy movement says, the 99%, you know, those, those below. And uh, that's true in Latin America, it's true everywhere. So. Uh, with the increasing power of technology, this is another po point of my reasoning here, with the increasing power of technology, social conflict can become, has become increasingly destructive and can be suicidal for the entire human civilization. So if this is, uh, if this is true, then to preserve human civilization and build on the best of it, we must eliminate social conflict. We, this is very ambitious, I understand that, but we must eliminate social conflict, which requires that we must eliminate social hierarchies. Not social, not human diversity, right? Not human uh, uh, differences, but hierarchies. I don't see a way around it, right? I, I think that the, the uh, I've been studying technology lately, and so I, uh, I be, um, unfortunately, the, uh, the most advanced applications of technology are nowadays, of course, in the military. They are in war making. That's where they are, right? A little bit of technology has been developed, you know, as a result of Fukushima disaster and, you know, to deal with emergencies and things like that. For the most part, the development of these devices, robots and all that is for applications that involve the destruction of people. And, uh, and so uh, the obliteration of, uh, of people. And so I think that, that, uh, that the, the committing, you know, uh, uh, collective suicide is not beyond the realm of possibilities. And, uh, and it's, it, that possibility is increasing as we speak. And so we have to be bold enough to recognize that we need to end social inequality, right? In that sense that I mentioned. Now, you may think that this is radical, but that's because you haven't read the Pope's encycl uh, encyclical, the uh, Laudato Si. Have you read it? You have read it, then uh, I'm shy of radical, okay? So, is, but now, is this possible? Is it possible to really dismantle, uh, you know, the hierarchical uh, structure of society uh, nowadays? Uh, uh, I don't know. Maybe it's not possible. Maybe we are beyond redemption. <laughs> but, but I think that the logic of this argument, at least the way I can think of it, is inescapable. And I think that, that People like us, right, who are like very impatient with our devices, is like, why the heck is, you know, this phone is not doing this thing, and you know, we are very demanding on our on our gadgets and all that, and, and people who can imagine, who can ambition, and then who can manufacture these miracles, right, and and then accept that social oppression, inequality is a given. I don't think that, I don't think we are, we humans are wired that way. I'll end there. Thank you. The basis of social conflict is class conflict, and I didn't see anything about class conflict or oh, class okay. struggle which would lead to sort of revolution and to solve the problem that you referred to at the end, and I think it is possible. And hierarchy, etc., all is not basically due to technology due to the classes that they own the means of production, etc., etc. So I think that part is totally missed, is what I feel. I don't know. I, I don't think I'm contradicting that, right? When I say social inequality, of course, you know, what we call class is a dimension of that, right? Bas ba basically, all social inequality is inequality in, in the access to wealth. I think all inequality is inequality in the access to wealth. What does it mean to be, uh, you know, discriminated uh, because of, say, our gender inclinations or, or our, our, our sexual uh, inclinations or our gender or our race? Uh, it means that, that one way or another, right, there are social institutions that prevent our, you know, access to wealth, right? We, like, you know, like gay people who couldn't marry, right? So they, they couldn't, like, have uh, like full access to wealth because uh, ultimately legislation is the allocation of wealth 
the, the allocation of rights and obligations over wealth. So uh, it, this actually, when I mention social inequality, it covers that. It does refer to what is the foundation of capitalism in the classical, in the classical theories like you know, Adam Smith, Ricardo Marx. Well, capitalism is defined as a society where markets ha have become so developed that even the ability of people to work, labor power, has become a commodity, right? So you, you have to have so much inequality so that uh, labor markets exist. If you don't have people who are poor, who don't have other forms of wealth, and who therefore have to sell themselves or a portion of their time to employers, then you cannot have a labor market, and then you cannot have capitalism. So when I talk about social inequality, I'm referring to, okay, what, it, what Marx would call the distribution of the ownership over the means of production, or the conditions of production. Not only the objective ones, means of production, but the subjective ones, labor power. So that's social inequality in the terms that I'm trying to uh, discuss it here. You know, in terms of the relationship with the US, right? Uh, I think that, that uh, ideally, right, um, what, we, what we would have is a system of cooperation between the US and Latin America. So by independence, I don't mean severing ties with the United States. I mean, I mean resetting those ties, those relations, on a more equitable footing. So that, you know, like for example, think of NAFTA, the, National, uh, the North American Free Trade Agreement, right? The original uh, uh, NAFTA agreement like um, I, uh, it was a li slightly more favorable to Mexico, but it still reflect, reflected the asymmetries in economic power between Canada, the U.S., and Mexico. So uh, it's unavoidable. If you have people who have more power, that power is going to be reflected in any interaction. So, uh, uh, but you know, co cooperation with with the United States is, I, I think, it's necessary. But that cooperation has to be in a framework of, of respect, political respect, right, for the priorities of Latin Americans as they decide to set them, right? And so, uh, uh, you know, ideally, you would have a, a government in the United States that would respect that. But usually, this is what happened. This, perhaps I'm wrong on this, but I, have the, I am under the impression that uh, vested interest in the United States can do things, can get away with things abroad that they would never be allowed to do in the United States. So in Latin America, the behavior of like very respect, respectable financial and other corporate institutions is despicable, you know. And, uh, but, uh, you know, you wouldn't know here because they have a very strong PR machine and people think of them as, you know, they, they are law-abiding institutions like uh, you could list all the banks. Um, but uh, uh, so Latin Americans have a reason to be suspicious of, of this interest. Now, because the United States is such a large economy, right? Um, what we do matters a lot to Latin America. What Latin Americans do has very little impact on our lives, on our livelihood, etc. So as a result of that, we don't care much about foreign policy. We don't care much about, like right now, right, Obama has been just recently given approval by Congress to negotiate a, uh, uh, the, the, yeah, the, the uh, uh, what is it called? The Pacific Partnership, uh, the yeah, Trans-Pacific Partnership, right, the TPP. And so, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's almost like axiomatic to me that corporate interest are gonna have like a big say on those negotiations. They are pretty much gonna design, they are gonna write uh, those agreements. And uh, they are gonna try to push them through with the other negotiating partners. And so, uh, uh, is that reflecting the interest of the, of the regular American, of plain Americans? I don't think so, I don't think so. So, but that is something that corresponds to Americans to change, right? How you, you change that. But uh, so lat that means that for the time being, Latin Americans are going to have to fight for their independence, right? I don't mean necessarily that they have to resort to violent means for that, right? But but they may, if if and if, if, if you know, if push comes to shove, right? History also shows that that people, you know, have to uh, use the tools and the resources that they have at hand, 
right? Good or bad, that's what has happened historically. And this is not justification for anything, it's just, just plain uh, fact. Okay, so about ALBA, just quickly about ALBA, uh, this initiative was, uh, you know, uh, originally coming from Cuba and Venezuela, and then included Bolivia, etc. I think it was, it, it was a good initiative, and, and it, it, was, it had to fight against the pressures from the United States, the government. And uh, uh, unfortunately, it doesn't, uh, doesn't have as much punch, right? Uh, the uh, large economies in South America are, of course, Brazil and Argentina. Uh, they are the dominant economies, and without them, there is so much that you can do. Bolivia is one of the poorest, the poorest, actually, Bolivia is the poorest country in South America. The poorest. It's not an accident that Pope Francis decided to visit, when he decided to visit South America, that was the country that he visited. And P Pope Francis apologized for the role that the Catholic Church historically had during the conquest and the colonial period. So, uh, you know, in terms of priorities, I think that's, uh, that's a pretty, pretty clear message. And, uh, and then, when he had the choice to visit this region, right? Cuba first, then the United States. That's also kind of telling, indicative of where his, uh, his uh, sympathies lie. And um, um, uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm sympathetic for ALBA, but I, I, I don't think that, that ALBA by itself uh, can really overcome much.